This is CX of M Radio, the voice of customer experience professionals. Welcome to another World of UX podcast. This is your host, Darren Hood. Thanks for taking the time to join us on today. Special welcome, as always, to those of you who are joining the podcast for the very first time. Glad to have you. Uh, Today, we're going to have another potpourri segment, and I'm going to talk about two topics. I don't think this is going to be a long episode today, but we never know, do do we? Uh, uh, Two critical topics, and they're... Uh, coming to mind in light of a court, of course, and some things that we experienced recently and some things that we feel that would be a tremendous help. And, and, and thanks to all of you who give us the feedback, who let us know, who confirm the the usefulness of the information that that we share. It, it, it's really great to have that encouragement, that recognition, because folks, a lot of times doing this kind of stuff, we do this out of the kindness of our own heart. We do this because we want to give back to the community. We do this because we want to help people who are interested in growing and user experience. And there are a lot of detractors. There are a lot of trolls. There are a lot of people out there who they live to complain. They live to be critical. They're not interested in solutions. <laughs> They're not interested in, in any anyone holding them accountable for anything. And so there's a lot of a flack that comes up. Not a, not a ton. It's just that it does. People don't realize it doesn't take a lot for someone to behave in a certain manner. And then that behavior becomes a form of abuse. Truth, truth be told. So I'm thankful for people who do recognize the things that are said, who are able to apply the things that are said. And, and, and it's amazing. And we're actually going to talk about that a little bit in the two topics that we're going to bring up on tonight. But I just want to express my thanks for the people who do hear, who do understand, who do value, and who do apply and are able to achieve success through the things that we share. So a big shout out to you. Uh, I'm I'm, uh, bowing to you. I'm I'm very appreciative of of that because that really helps. It it gives us energy. It, It really helps us out. So thank you. Um, the two topics we're going to cover tonight, well, I'll just introduce the first. I'll keep the other one under wraps until we get there. The first one will be relatively short, and I'm sort of revisiting something that I covered in an episode some time ago. When we were talking about EQ, but I want to talk about important user experience personality traits. We talk about personas when we're doing user experience work and we're trying to understand and learn about who our users are, and we create personas to help us to focus on them, to to give ourselves a realistic perspective of who we're, who we're designing for. Uh, but personas are not just limited to that. There is a certain persona, as we talked about in the, in the series, so you want to be a UXer? There are personas, certain personas, that are pretty much made for user experience work, people who can thrive in doing the work. It's one thing to get the job. It's another thing to excel at the job. It's one thing to get the job. It's another thing for you to really be cut out for this work. And everybody is not cut out for user experience work. We want to talk about seven critical traits. And if you don't have these traits, then you either need to develop them because EQ can be learned They can be managed. It can be developed. So if you don't have them, go get them. If you've got a serious personality flaw, you're either going to have to go and make a change or you're going to have to look up a different line of work, frankly, because UX is like a lot of other disciplines. UX requires a certain kind of a mentality in order to really thrive. And the people who don't have these traits cannot thrive. So you ready? Seven important UX personality traits. Number one, you need to be curious. 
You need to be curious. You need to be the kind of person that always wants to discover something. You are interested in in finding out what makes something or someone tick. You need to be the kind of person who doesn't just believe that something is a particular thing or that it does work or that it is good, but you're willing to, even if you believe that, you're willing to objectively subject what it is you have a passion for or thoughts about to the test to confirm whether or not you, your thoughts or, or whether or not something is actually authentic, whether it be your thoughts, a stakeholder's thoughts, or whoever it might be. We must be curious in order to succeed at user experience work. If people are indifferent, indifferent people and people who frown upon passion will struggle. They'll get a job, but they'll struggle to bring value to the position. And if they struggle to bring value to the position, they're going to struggle to represent the discipline. Uh, they're going to struggle to, to, to be able to show UX for what it really is to stakeholders to leaders, uh, to everyone, they, they'll struggle to th- to achieve the types of successes that are needed because it's just not curious enough. So uh, that's number one. Number two, number two important UX personality trait: you must be pragmatic. Uh, what does that mean? It means that you have to be practical, very realistic, very grounded. Uh, Because we are a data-driven group of folks, basically speaking, and we are grounded in trying to focus on what actually works versus just trying to be idealistic. And, And a lot of times, idealism is usually associated with innovation, but that's not really true. There are a lot of innovations are grounded in what's practical. And even if you do come up with something that is idealistic, because we're not saying that idealism is not good, but if you're truly pragmatic, even when something that is idealistic comes up, you'll you'll want to take the time to validate that idealism. You want to make sure that it's really practical. So practicality is more critical than idealism, though idealism is good, uh, but pragmatism rules. Overall, trait number three, you must be adaptive and you must be flexible. It it is very interesting to see a lot of people today who are interested in getting into user experience and they look for templates. They look for processes. They look for some kind of cookie cutter type of an approach when truth be told, we can, there's, a ton of different processes and technically they're all really pretty much the same thing with different terminology (laughs) sprinkled throughout, but it's basically all, they're all the same thing. And even you have processes that are parts of other disciplines and they're actually the same exact thing that we do. They just call them something different. And in instructional design, they had a a development process called Addy and, and uh, which is an acronym and I won't get into what Addy stands for, but really, it, it's no different than what we do when you look at Jesse James Garrett's Five Planes. If you look at what people are doing with design thinking or design sprints, uh, it doesn't matter. If you look at Double Diamond, it's all the same thing. So here we are setting out to do some work. And if you are just just too rooted and grounded and dependent upon and, and and don't want to move, don't want to approach work differently, you're going to find yourself in a bit of a trick bag because being adaptive and being flexible is very important to the user experience professional because we can think that we're going to approach the work a particular way. And all you have to do is change a couple of, 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 of issues or elements associated with the work that we're doing. And we need to be able to pivot that takes that takes adaptability. That takes flexibility. So those types of things are critical. Don't be so so uh, determined to work in a particular way 
that when the time comes to pivot, that you can't do it. Uh, and a lot of the people who are looking at these templates, who are trying to templatize everything that we do in UX, uh, really, that's and that's another topic in and of itself, where people are trying to oversimplify the work and they think that one size fits all and that everything's going to be done the same way. It simply isn't true. So you if you if you know that you're not that flexible and you know that you're not that good at pivoting or having your head on a swivel, that's something that you can work, practice shifting, practice doing something different, practice getting some information at the last minute that causes you to have to move differently. That skill is critical to succeeding in user experience. So uh, we want to be about having that in our toolbox from a mental perspective, so to speak. Number four, we need to be resilient. (laughs) This one is so important for user experience professionals because we are oftentimes, uh, I mean, a lot of people want to get into UX and they think it's really easy and they think that all we do is make things look pretty and they don't really understand the full landscape of what we do and they don't understand that this can be an extremely combative uh, and extremely volatile arena because a lot of times people do not understand what user experience is. They think we do one thing when we do another. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to meetings in my career with different stakeholders and a lot of people come to those meetings and they start talking about things and they have no idea that they're actually talking about what our job is. And so they sit in these meetings and they start trying to do our work and, 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 and you can't just go in there and tell people that they're doing our job. Um, you have to be patient. That's one we didn't mention, but that's critical as well. You have to be patient. We, we have to pick our battles. We can't try to correct everybody every time something happens. And a lot of that kind of stuff, it, it really can take you for a loop. Uh, another example uh, of the need for resilience that comes to mind is how often we will present something. Imagine yourself doing a ton of research, the best research you've ever done in your career. You've got all the data, all the answers. You know what's going on. You come and you present your findings to the team. You give your recommendations. And after hearing all of that, people still decide that they want to do what they want to do. And they had already decided to do that. They had no interest in hearing your, about your data anyway. And and when you put your best foot forward and people demonstrate that they don't value or respect you, that can really take you for a loop. And so that having that resilient mindset, we have to be willing to endure. We have to be willing to be patient. We have to be willing to remain professional at all times. So that resilient mindset is critical to being successful in user experience. Number five is the trait of neutrality. Uh, What do we mean when we say that? We're talking about the ability to manage one's own biases and work uh, for the greater good. Don't just be so determined to do something because it's what you want or, or even because some stakeholder, some 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 hippo, some highest paid person gives you their opinion and, and you're you don't you can't. It's not our job to follow the uh, the dictates of somebody because that's their bias or or because they have an interest in going a particular way. We have to be neutral. We have biases that we have to manage. We have to manage the team's biases. We have to make sure we're working for the greater good and not for any particular interest group or or passions or biases that somebody else has. Neutrality is a skill that somebody has to develop. It's something we have to work very hard to maintain. So please make sure that you have a passion for neutrality today. Number six, and this one's going to go under the radar, and I've got a little bit to say about this one. Matter of fact, we might have to save the other ones till next week because I do want to be brief today. Number six is friendliness. Friendliness. Are you likable? Are you approachable? 
can you explain something in a way that you're not, I mean, don't be purposely antagonistic. All you have to do to become antagonistic is say something that's not popular. And I mean, I get labeled a particular way and I'm just willing to say what a lot of other people are unwilling to say. And that's really sad. Touch on this for a moment that people will, I'm willing to say what a lot of other people, they know some of them even come and tell me, they don't tell me in everybody's where everybody can see them, but they tell me, I'm so glad you said that. That really needs to be said, but I I can't really say it, but I'm sure glad you did. People know that the things that we share on this podcast are things that need to be said, but there's a whole ton of people out there. Many of them are afraid to say what I'm saying. Many of them are, they don't know how, they, they know that it needs to be said. In some instances, I hear about this a lot. Darren, I'm so glad you said that. I feel the same way. I just didn't know how to say it. So you have some people who are afraid. You have some people that don't know how to express it. And you even have people out there who, and and this is really sad, they know it needs to be said. They know it's true, but they'd rather have you be their friend. So they don't want to lose someone's friendship. So they'd rather not tell you what you need to hear and keep you as a friend, even though what they did isn't very friendly, is it? If you have spinach in your teeth, would you like someone to tell you? Would you tell someone if they had spinach in their teeth? Would you tell a guy if he if his fly is down, <laughs> if his zipper is down? Or would you just sit there and say nothing and let the person go on and be embarrassed or get into a, a weird scenario? There has to be a, a, a friendliness. We have to be willing to... I mean, first, we need to understand what it is to be a friend. There's an old proverb that says that a friend loves at all times. Are you willing to say what needs to be said, even though it might actually come back on you? It it might boomerang back on you in a way that makes you look bad. I'm, I'm more concerned about the success of others than my own reputation. You know, so, I mean, I'm hearing some some other things that come to mind. You have to be selfless. Because user experience is not an ego-driven discipline. It's always about the business. It's always about the user. It's always about the team. It should always be about the discipline. And so just looking at it from that perspective, if you're not selfless, which is a component of being friendly, if you're not selfless, if you're not friendly, you are not going to, to succeed not the way you could in user experience. We've got to be friendly folks. When, when you're talking about something, you have to, I mean, pushing back. There's a, not a trait, but a skill. We have to be able to push back in order to be successful. If somebody suggests something, if somebody presents something and it's not a good idea, it, it's something that's not in the best interest of the user, it's not in the best interest of the business. So keeping in mind that you still need to be friendly, a friend is a person who will tell you what you need to hear, despite how it might make you feel. And it might be tough. It's even hard to say sometimes for the person who's sharing that that message or making that statement or bringing something to light. But if you care about that other person enough, if, if if you're selfless, then you're willing to do it. And there's a lot of people out there who would rather tickle your ear because they don't want to come across as being judgy. That's the the goofy popular statement that I talk about a lot from time to time, but be friendly folks. I, I mean, you just can't be a nasty person and succeed at UX. Again, nasty people can get a job in UX and many do nasty. People can get a leadership in UX and many do. But you're not going to thrive. I mean, it's one thing, again, to get the job, but there is a, a, a limit to one's success if you do not have certain traits. And, and nasty people can't be a good team player. Nasty people cannot truly empathize for users because they're too busy focusing on self 
to understand the needs of others and are too busy looking at their own personal success to look at the success of others. So we got to get outside of ourselves. And I mean, were you a friendly kid? If you weren't a friendly kid and you're probably not a friendly adult, you got work to do. If you, if you were a friendly kid and, and you got along with everybody, were you really genuinely friendly or were you a little politician? It, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting thought and an interesting concept because of the concepts, the way that people think about being friendly, but take a look at it, study the thing. Learn if you're no, you're not genuine. Learn to be genuine. If you're the kind of person that uh, I mean, because a lot of people appear to be friendly and they're actually double tongued and two faced. They're they're one way in front of one person and one way in front of another. When we say friendly, we're not talking about that. We're talking about being genuine. We're talking about being the real deal. We're talking about being honest. We're talking about being transparent. And we're talking about being a person that folks can count on. That's what friends do. We're talking about a person that's supportive. That's what friends do. I mean, the friendly person is the person that drives the team forward because that person is always looking out for everyone's best interest as well as de- developing themselves the way that they should. So, so being friendly is one of the more critical elements, especially in this day and time, when misinformation is everywhere, if you're friendly, you won't share misinformation. Friends don't lie. Some people say, Darren, it is good to lie sometime. Really? Okay. You let me know who you are so I can keep my distance from you because I like being around quality people. I like keeping quality people around me. And lying is not a quality that that has any true merit. And a lot of people are going to struggle with that. But hey, we're just telling you. I mean, can you imagine if you lie to your stakeholders? Can you imagine if you lie to your users? Can you imagine if you lie to participants when you're conducting research? Yeah, it begins to lose its luster after a while, especially when you consider the fact that you're talking to adults and that lie is eventually going to to be manifest for what it really is. And when that lie manifests itself for what it really is, uh, you're going to end up with mud all over your face. It's easier to tell the truth. It's more respectful to tell the truth. You garner more respect when you tell the truth. And all of that stuff is baked inside of being friendly. It's all a part of being friendly. And the last one, and we're going to wrap up here for today, folks, is we need to have, as trait number seven, we need to have a good sense of perception. We need to be able to understand when something is good, when it's not. We need to be able to read the room. We need to understand when, if we're working on something and we realize, you know what, I really need to put forth a little bit more effort. I feel like there's something more that I can discover. There's there's another level of excellence that I can achieve. And so you perceive when you need extra effort. You perceive when the team needs a little bit more uh, support from leadership. Perception is another really broad skill that can really be applied in a lot of different areas. And if nothing else, for starters, work on reading the room, work on reading your team, work on being able to recognize things. If I had to sum up perception, focusing on one thing, Learn how to recognize things that are that are not being manifest or shared through actual communication, verbal communication, if you will. Perception could be involved with body language. It could be that that one thing that somebody, sometimes maybe people are communicating, and if you're perceptive, when you have higher levels of perception, people are saying something, but they're not saying something. You can tell when somebody maybe is not comfortable sharing something and it's coming out in the way they're expressing themselves. And when you, when you sort of combine that with that curious nature, trait number one, when you pick up on that thing, then you can start to probe, you can start to ask 
questions and you can find out what's going on. So a lot of these traits that I just mentioned, they're, they're not like standalones. They, they can be combined with others and it helps to drive value and drive success in the work that we do and with the goals that we have uh, before us. So being perceptive is critical. And again, uh, before I even wrap up, there's another aspect of perception, which is going to lead us into the this other topic, uh, the second topic, and I'll cover it in the potpourri next week as we wrap this up. Then you need to be perceptive about the environment that you're in. Are you in a good UX environment or are you in an environment that that could you could use some 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 a little a little tweaking a little maintenance and I mean there, again so many things that perception can be applied to but again if nothing else apply it to your your participants your team members um, the work that you do and, and that's something that will take you a long long way but the UX professional that is not perceptive. When you can't perceive things, then you can't take certain action. When you can't perceive things, you don't realize when you're at a deficit. When you can't perceive things, you don't know that there's a need. When you can't perceive things, you will think that things are good when they're not, and you'll think they're bad when maybe they're great, because there's a there's an element of accuracy associated with that perception that's critical for us to, to thrive, to achieve. Uh, so the more perceptive we are, the more and the more responsive we are, the better we're going to be, the higher levels of success we will achieve and the more of a um, benefit and a value we bring to our teams. So, folks, I, I thought I was going to cover two topics today. We're not going to do that. We're going to keep this short and sweet for today. Remember, seven critical personality traits important for the successful UX professional being curious and inquisitive. Number two, being pragmatic. Number three, being adaptive and flexible. Number four, being resilient. Number five, having a strong sense of neutrality, being neutral. Number six, be friendly. Again, remember, nasty people do not make good UX professionals. Uh, And number seven, be perceptive. So that's it for today, folks. We're going to wrap it up there. So until next week, Uh, Time to sign off. This is Darren Hood, the host of The World of UX. Happy UXing, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this session of CX of M Radio. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit cxofm.org for more resources.